Nuclear negotiations between the United States and North Korea have pretty much been at a complete standstill for almost a year now, ever since the breakdown in summit talks between the US President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Hanoi. While the Trump administration has been trying to reach a nuclear deal with North Korea over the last couple of years, it has at the same time scrapped another nuclear deal with Iran and recently killed their top general with a drone strike. It's a remarkable reversal of policy from the previous administration, and it raises the question, can North Korea be convinced to give up its nuclear weapons in this environment? To discuss this further, I'm delighted to say that we have joining us in the studio today, former US intelligence analyst Bruce Bechtel, who is currently a professor of political science at Angelo State University in Texas and a leading expert on North Korea. Welcome to the show, Professor. I'm honored to be here. So I'd like to start with a very broad question to kick things off. How do you assess the current situation between the US and North Korea and their stalled denuclearization talks? Great question. Um, As you know, we've talked about this offline before. Um, This really went downhill when um, Kim Jong-un offered President Trump uh, to shut down everything at Yongbyon, and Trump said, that's not good enough. We want you to shut down that site at Soweidi, a few kilometers from Yongbyon as well. And when Kim Jong-un refused to do that, um, of course, our president walked away, President Trump. Um, Since that point, we've been trying to get back to what is a good first step for North Korea. And there's been two things that have really affected that. The first is North Korea doesn't want to shut down that HEU facility at Soweidi. And the second thing is they absolutely refuse to have talks at any level other than Trump and Kim. In other words, those those uh, lower level talks among people like Secretary Began and his counterparts in the DPRK have not occurred. The North Koreans have never agreed to have such talks. It's going to be hard to get the details until they do. So that's where we are now as far as where the talks go. Um, the North Koreans have not reached out to the United States, but as you know, both uh, now Deputy Secretary Began and our own President Trump have said the door is still open for talks. So you're placing, I guess, the situation, the blame on North Korea right now. But uh, North Koreans would say at the same time, uh, the U.S. haven't been budging on their requirements uh, for for the denuclearization. Well, that's an interesting point. But see, the problem with that hypothesis is that the... um, the conditions that the U.S. have sent have always been the same. The United States has said from the very beginning when these talks were set up that this is not going to be an action for action, tit for tat, like it has been with Obama, with Clinton, with with President Bush number two. Um, the objective is make a large step first, a large step that is transparent and be, can be verified by both international and rock and U.S. authorities, and then will ease sanctions. But isn't that asking for too much from North Korea at this point? Because they they have a lot to lose as well. Um, You mean... I mean, like, asking North Korea to completely, like, denuclearize or take very big steps, but North Korea are going to need assurance as well, and uh, their fear is it could destabilize their re- regime and... Uh, eventually lead to their regime downfall. That's what their concerns are. You know, that's a very good point, because literally having a nuclear program is in the North Korean constitution. So this has been not just with Kim Jong-un, but with his father, Kim Jong-il, and with his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, this has been a big deal. The nuclear program has been, this, as some would call it, the sword of the regime, the thing that takes them from being a small, not-so-powerful country to being a world power in their minds. Um, nevertheless, if they want to join the list of non-rogue nations on the international scene, if they want sanctions lifted, then it's going to have to occur. They're going to have to show real, concrete, transparent, verifiable uh, steps that the United States and the Republic of Korea, of course, um, can look at and see and say, that means they're on the road to denuclearization, and then those sanctions will end, not just with the United States, but, of course, with the United Nations. There was an article that came out in a North Korean state-run newspaper today that cited the example of what happened with Iraq as an example for not caving to sanctions, the article explained that imperialist nations use the promise of sanctions release as a decoy and that Iraq was a case in point where they were 
willing to uh, co cooperate, but then it ended up where their regime fell and without even being able to put up a fight. This shows North Korea's deep distrust of the US, it feels, and that even sanctions relief will not necessarily mean that they would want to let go of their nuclear weapons. That's true. And and the other aspect about that is, even if New North Korea claims that they've given up all their nuclear weapons, have they actually done it? Um, that site at Soweet E I described, um, that's not well known, but it was in the Chosen Elbow, for example, 10 years ago. Um, so if they give up and tell us they're giving up all of their nuclear weapons, are they really? Um, that's why verifiable is a very important word here. Now, if you're talking about Iraq and sanctions or Iran and sanctions. So the, this, this article, the North Korean article, was referring to Iraq. Yes, and that's, and that's very true. Um, the problem with Iraq, unlike North Korea, is they just haven't had a stable government. Mm. And they've still got, un, again, unlike North Korea, they've still got religious problems. They've got uh, eth uh, ethnic problems, of course, the Kurds, the Shiites, the Sunnis. So um, there are all kinds of issues there that don't involve North Korea and never will. So it's actually like apples and oranges. But to claim the United States... Um, is not trustworthy when you have proven yourself to be probably the most untrustworthy nation state in the modern times is is pretty amusing actually i i think everybody understands and knows that if north korea takes transparent steps to give up their nuclear program sanctions are going to be eased let's bring in now the situation with uh, the recent situation with iran now as i mentioned at the introduction when the trump administration came in it moved quickly it moved quickly to scrap the iran nuclear deal and reversing the work of the past administration and in recent weeks it's killed the top iranian general qasem soleimani without much warning mm -hmm. how do you think this has been viewed in north korea and is it possible to convince north korea to give up its nuclear weapons in this environment Boy, that's a great question. Um, you know, first let's let's look at Iran and the JCPOA. Um, the JCPOA was not approved in the Senate, which, as you know, under the United States Constitution, has to uh, you have to have a Senate majority to have an actual treaty, which is why the JCPOA is an agreement, not a treaty, because uh, President Obama was not supported by the United States Congress on that. There was only a minority that supported him. Um, I think the JCPOA was a very bad deal. Um, it addressed, much like a deal with North Korea would, only their nuclear program, not their support to terrorism, not their chemical weapons program or biological weapons program, and certainly uh, not their very large army. So um, I think it was a bad deal. I think our president, uh, the U.S. President Trump, did the right thing in rescinding the deal. Um, it is in Iran's best interest, much like I think in the long run it will be in North Korea's best interest, to give up that nuclear program, to really give it up, which they have not done. Um, as far as killing General Soleimani, um, that man was responsible for a great deal of violence against American troops. And I, I think the president did the right thing to order his killing. Um, what you're seeing now in the United States is a lot of partisan politics. We did this with uh, Osama bin Laden. We've done it with others. Um, you are seeing really, really big polarization in the Congress and between Trump and, and the Democrats. And I think that's why there's a lot of criticism in the United States. But then how does North Korea make a deal with the US, but then believe that it can be long term when the next administration things might reverse like it's done with Iran? That's a, another, you're asking great questions today. Um, I, I think the key to that is make it a treaty, not just an agreement like the JCPOA was. In other words, the Koreans have said they want a peace treaty, um, but uh, it, it hasn't come about yet. I think it can. I think if it does, that's a good thing. The United States is just going to need to make sure we have a majority in the Congress that's supporting the president when he makes this deal. And I think it's something that our president would be very open to. This situation with Iran actually raises another interesting relationship between Iran and North Korea. Professor, in a previous interview, you said 
in your book as well, there's sufficient evidence that North Korea provided missile technology and related support to Iran, as well as follow-up support measures. Mm -hmm. Your book, the 2018 book, North Korean Military Proliferation in the Middle East and Africa, that uh, you have with you today, you pointed out that North Korea's proliferation of missiles is threatening the U.S. through the Middle East. Can you elaborate a bit more on this? Certainly. Well, uh, Iran is being armed by North Koreans, but Iran is also paying for the arming of Syria. And not only Syria and Iran, but the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah, Hamas. Why is this important? Well, the Houthis in Yemen have been launching missiles probably made in North Korea. The UN panel of experts has stated they uh, were cutting missile deals last year. Uh, so one of our key allies, Saudi Arabia, is being pressured, uh, being attacked by missiles supplied by North Korea. On the other end of that, obviously, Israel, a key ally. We're as close to Israel as we are South Korea, some of our closest allies. The Israelis are being attacked, not by just rockets, but by small arms, uh, the North Koreans have assisted Hezbollah in building tunnels under the border with Israel, all kinds of stuff. That's a big deal. But the key thing that came out that made everything unambiguous two weeks ago was when the Iranians attacked U.S. bases, and one of the missile systems they used was a Qiyam, Q-I-A-M. A Qiyam is nothing more than a modified Scud C, which the Iranians bought from uh, the North Koreans. They liked it, so the North Koreans built a factory in Iran, and the factory could only operate with North Korean made components, and then they upgraded it, so it was called now the QIAM, and fired it at American bases. So now we're seeing a direct correlation between North Korean proliferation and a nation state using the weapons supplied by North Korea to attack American troops in a key combat zone in the Middle East. So do you think then the fact that the US and Iran are having rising tensions, this situation will perhaps increase cooperation between North Korea and Iran now? I'm not sure how you could increase cooperation. Um, because they're already, you're saying they're already fully uh, oh, working yes. hand in hand. Um, uh, David Asher, who uh, testified before Congress and was a key member of the Bush administration, has said that North Korea gets 40% of its real economy from illicit activities. The bulk of that comes from proliferation of weapons, especially high end weapons like chemical weapons and missiles, etc. The biggest chunk of that comes from Iran, which generates between two to three billion, with a B, dollars for North Korea's economy every year. The Syrian civil war just made it bigger because Iran doesn't just buy weapons for itself, it buys weapons for all of its proxies, including nation states like Syria. Um, so could the relationship get closer? I guess it could. Iran could buy even more weapons from North Korea. But just so your listeners know, this is already a very robust relationship, and they are easily North Korea's most important military proliferation customer. Wow, and that's an indirect threat to the U.S. then as well. Yes, sir. Let's move on to how this situation with North Korea might develop. How big of a concern is North Korea for Trump and his administration, do you think, Professor? Especially when we consider that there is a presidential election coming up in November. Does that, that play into how Trump might uh, deal with uh, the North Korean regime? Yes, and I'm going to say something that will probably surprise you. It's a lot more about a threat than it is about politics of a threat. And as you know, those are two different things, and that was a great question. And I think this goes all the way back to the beginning of the Trump administration in February of 2017 when he was briefed by the Obama folks that were leaving that this is a big threat, that North Korea is advancing its systems at a rapid rate, nuclear programs, missile programs, uh, conventional arms programs, and proliferating that stuff around the world. If you see it in North Korea today, you see it in Iran tomorrow. And he realized then that this was a big threat. Now, is it important for him personally that people have the perception that North, the North Korean threat has been reduced? Sure, for any politician it is, but he wants to do it because he actually wants to reduce the North Korean threat. Right, I'm interested, will it win him more votes? That's what I'm also thinking. The fact that um, he's seen as a leader who's taking on this issue. Yes, 
Do you think the I, North? I mean, do the U.S. people uh, have that much invested? I think so, but I think it's going to think about this. Since since the nineteen nineties, uh, when Kim Il Sung was still in power, what success has any American president had in dealing with North Korea? So, I mean. People that say that Trump hasn't done well so far, that his plan is is not good. Why? Because all the other plans work so well. Um, so what I'm saying is American people want to see the, the North Korean threat genuinely contained. Mm. Can Trump do that? I think he can, but it's going to take a lot of cooperation and trust, as you said, from the North Koreans. As a very brief side note, do you think Trump will get reelected? Because the future of the situation with North Korea and Iran and many of these situations, I feel, rests with which administration will be in the White House in a year's time. That's a genuine concern, I think. I think if, if somebody like the, the present uh, junior senator from Massachusetts gets elected, God only knows what will happen in uh, dealings in the Far East. But on a serious note, um, in the United States, in states like where I live, Texas, Trump is very popular. So Koreans need to understand, your listeners need to understand, that while they may hear negative things coming out of the D.C. beltway, that's not America writ large. I think it could be a close election. I think it may actually end up not being close at all, and Trump will get reelected. Professor, as a final thought, Seoul, as you know, is trying to restart inter-Korean tour projects, among other cross-border projects, and hoping that by improving inter-Korean relations, it could create a better environment to convince the US to ease sanctions and that that in turn might lead to resumption of nuclear talks. So they feel inter-Korean relations is the key for the denuclearization and negotiations overall. How do you evaluate these efforts by Seoul? I'm going to surprise you. I think inter-Korean relations are the most important. This is your country. You are the most important people. It's your decision. Um, so, I mean, the United States has a very strong and very good relationship with, with the Republic of Korea, no matter who our president is. But um, I think any president, whether it's Trump or somebody else, is going to be very hesitant to give up on sanctions. So if the, if the things go to Kumgang, for example, I think that's going to have to be something is it, that does not generate funds for the DPRK. I think we'll have to end it there. Unfortunately, we've been speaking to Bruce Bechtel, Professor of Political Science at Angelo State University. It's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you for your time today, and we hope we to speak to you again soon. Thanks for having me.